Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me over to your lecture at the University of Sao Paulo. And it's a particular pleasure for me to deliver this lecture as um, your uh, professor, Flavio, actually was one of the people uh, who made this one here possible. This is the, uh, the Brazilian edition of our textbook, uh, Principles of Management, uh, Practicing Ethics, Responsibility and Sustainability. Um, out of which he, uh, he asked me to uh, talk a little bit more about the strategizing chapter. I understand that um, this week for you is all about the organizational processes and that you actually have read um, the chapter of the first edition of that textbook uh, on strategy. So I uh, will give you a little bit of a preview on the second edition. Um, so let's see how that, uh, how that goes. There we are. Good, so this is the second edition of the textbook. Um, it's slightly different from the first edition, but um, the chapter itself has many contents which are still uh, along the same lines of what you have had a close look at. But uh, one of the major changes really, it is about strategizing, which sounds a little bit strange, doesn't it? Or unusual at least. So it is about the practices and processes of strategy. It is not as much about the outcome of strategy. And you will see that this actually makes quite a difference in the way how we frame and understand what strategy and strategizing is. Um, does that look like a typical strategy meeting, a strategy session? Do they all look like the CEOs and uh, C-level suit managers we typically think are the, the strategic decision makers? No, they don't. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, very often actually the strategizing process is one that is not necessarily top down, but it is something that involves a, a very non-hierarchical, collaborative, sometimes informal process. Um, but at the, at the core of that process, very often are the very same tools that we uh, typically look at in the strategy uh, uh, sessions of a course. So there would be the typical SWOT analysis as probably the one that most people use, uh, but then also the Portless Five Forces model, or you might think about the uh, different analysis of uh, strategic capabilities. So we'll have a little bit of all of this, but always with an eye on how does that actually all happen practically and what are the practices of strategizing? Um, let's, let's have a first look as an, at an example. So I, I really like this one. It is about um, the uh, uh, company uh, uh, Premium Cola. Uh, Premium Cola is a uh, Hamburg-based uh, German uh, company uh, um, producing lemonades, basically. And uh, what they did was actually when their favorite, uh, favorite brand um, of, uh, of cola was, was phased out because it had been bought, uh, Africola was the brand, um, they actually took the original recipe of that brand and built their own company around it. So a little bit of a pirate action already from the very beginning. And they did that because they missed the flavor. It wasn't because they wanted to become entrepreneurs or, or business owners or somebody running a big corporation. No, it was a strategy to achieve their goal, which was to get the flavor of that particularly uh, tasty thing back. Um, and uh, while doing so, because they do it very, uh, in a very unusual way and out of an unusual motivation, um, their strategizing processes are also very different. So uh, where other people try to protect um, their strategic competitive advantages, for instance, they try to openly fair, share it, so an open franchise model, um, in order to be able to, uh, to pass on that recipe to as many people as possible so that the flavor would come back. Um, but also the strategy or strategizing process itself is interesting because it is open strategy. Um, and the idea be behind open strategy is actually that you involve as many as possible of your stakeholders in the strategizing process, although there's an interesting balance because also you want to retain some level of control. Um, but what I like about it is particularly as uh, Ed Freeman said, uh, or, or what comes to life with it is uh, what Ed, Ed Freeman said a long time ago in his uh, uh, book, um, Strategic Management, a stakeholder perspective, a bestseller, and where the, the term stakeholder was coined or made popular. So he said that basically what, what else could a strategic management process be uh, other than dealing with stakeholders? So being able to somehow find that combination of different goals that actually maximize or at least harmonize the value that our organization produces for all of the different stakeholders. So not only shareholders, not only communities either, not only society, not only the owners of the business or the, uh, the managers either, but some, something that sits somewhere in between. And that's what this session is really all about. So, and there you see the, the, the emphasis here is really about the, on the strategizing itself. 
um, the practicing, so what you do and the practices, so the kind of established ways of doing it and how they come together in a uh, strategizing process. And, and the, uh, um, we, we can actually, when we look at strategizing through that lens of uh, responsible management, we can see two different perspectives of strategizing. And one is uh, that there's the broad perspective, so the business case. And the idea here is we can call everything strategic responsible management or strategic CSR or strategic sustainability or strategic ethics um, if it somehow helps the business. So if there's a business case for it. That's what I call the broad perspective. But then there's also a narrow, much more uh, well-defined perspective where actually um, it is all about the strategizing process. So how do you do that for the in, uh, uh, to start with um, for an ethical or sustainable or responsible purpose? So are your goals actually uh, ethically, uh, ethically uh, sustainably and responsibly endorsed if you want so or in line, aligned with it? Um, and the other one is, do you actually do it ethically, sustainably, and responsibly? So, and if you do that, you could call yourself something uh, like a professional uh, uh, strategist or a strategy practitioner, somebody who is able to serve some kind of societal and, and environmental planetary goals while doing the strategy process. This is the idea. Well, and overall, this process often we can, a little bit artificially, but that's how we do it, subdivide it into those uh, uh, five, respectively, four different parts. So zero, responsible competitiveness, right in the middle. The idea that we're actually competitive for all stakeholders, not only competitive in terms of our own internal managerial or owner goals. Um, we're shaping objectives according to that. We're analyzing the context according to that. We're formulating strategies according to that. And we're also executing and evaluating our strategies according to that. And then it just starts from the very beginning once again. So let's go, go down to the first one, responsible competitiveness. Um, so if we think in terms of responsible competitiveness, how do we actually find out if our strategy is good at all? Because it's different from our traditional way of strategizing. We would think about, traditionally we would think about um, so, okay, so if it gives me more market share, or if it increases my shareholder value, or maybe if I'm actually beating the competition, so if I'm crowding, like pushing somebody out of the market, well, that's a good strategy, isn't it? Um, or if you go with classical textbook, you would typically say, if the strategy actually has uh, increased the value of my company above average market returns, I have a better strategy than the, uh, the average market. And that's all boring, isn't it? Because you're just... Uh, competing on that one dimension. And uh, organizations are not just about that one dimension. That's exactly the point that we're having here. So a good strategy is one which achieves its goals and larger purpose. So and th those might be any goals and larger purpose. And an even better strategy is one that actually does so in order to serve society and the planet. And the best strategy is, which does number one, number two, and number three, which means we're doing so in a good way, sustainably, responsibly, and ethically. Um, and then, of, of course, in the, we, uh, we have some traditional ways of uh, seeing what a good strategy is. We're saying, OK, if you're able to achieve that competitive strategic advantage, um, well, then you are actually uh, better than your peers. So you have an advantage of the others and your strategy is better than that of your peers. But then the idea is, well, you could actually think about um, interacting differently with your peers. And with your peers, I mean your competitors in the traditional perspective. Um, you could actually achieve a better strategic position and not better than the others, but better overall in terms of creating the value that you want to create, the goal, achieving the goal you want to achieve uh, with your peers. And this is what happening, what's happening very often in the sustainability context. It's very often what's happens in social enterprises. And I think traditional enterprises can learn a lot from it because if you open up your goals towards something that's beyond beating the competition and being the best economically or commercially, well, then actually you can re achieve even higher goals than you could if you're competing against uh, than if you're competing against everybody else. And then there's the term of competition, which is very closely related to what we said just now. Good. And uh, one interesting example I would like to invite you to look at, uh, it's one of the cases we cover in the book as well, is uh, the company Allsafe. So Allsafe is a boring company, they say it themselves, um, because they're doing a very boring product. And uh, the product is fixtures. So anything that you use in order to fix things in transport so that they don't move around and don't cause accidents and so on and don't break. Uh, but that's actually a very, very important societal role. So to make traffic and transport safer, 
really important. Logistics to bring goods in a in a uh, in a in a uh, in, in the best state possible from A to B because our our countries and 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 the world economy runs based on those goods. Some of them we can forget about, but the basic goods we need to get them from A to B. That's really important. Um, so and and uh, the interesting thing there is actually that they see themselves as having several competitive advantages. They think, okay, well they know. Um, they're the world leader in uh, those fixtures, although they're a, a medium-sized company. Um, so that's the economic part. But then also they say, well, actually we're best at making transport safer. So that's the other strategic advantage because one of their strategies is actually to serve society in the way that we just said before. And then they actually have an internal purpose goal as well, which is giving people employment where they can be free, where they can do when they work, where they can work the way they want to. So in uh, in Brazil, of course, you do have the the famous Samco, Samla Corporation examples with Ricardo Samla in the uh, end 1990s getting very popular with that kind of management, um, where you are able to actually give people a workplace where they can really um, become who they the, the best version of their of, them, of themselves that they could become uh, in the workplace because you're breaking down uh, barriers uh, you're getting rid of budgets where you would have to ask for uh, for permission um, uh, you don't you don't need to get approval for your vacations and so on so this is the idea so there we've got at least three different value propositions and uh, depending on how uh, well value propositions in terms of goals so depending on how uh, good you actually are on either one of them, your overall competitive advantage or responsible competitive advantage comes up or doesn't. So we can be res uh, responsibly competitive and irresponsibly competitive. I think, I think uh, so much is clear so far. So how do we actually shape a uh, strategic purpose and ob objectives based on that insight? So of course, vision statement, mission statement, strategic objectives. I know you're very advanced learners and many of you are professors, so I don't really need to go deeply into those. Um, another example that uh, many people have talked about is uh, of course Unilever and how their, um, their vision statement uh, and their mission statements translated into those 50 goals that they have. Um, they're what they call the sustainable living plan. Um, so 50 sub goals, social and environment, environmental mostly, sometimes socioeconomic goals as well, that directly came out of their vision and mission statement to be actually uh, to actually be a company for the world, not just a company that uh, gets from the world, that uses the world as resources. Um, so how do we analyze the strategic context then? And there's many different tools. And again, you're very advanced learners, so I'm not going to go deeply into, uh, into either one of them. Uh, but just as an idea, so we do have the very... Uh, kind of wide strategic analysis, the pestle analysis typically. And um, that's the one that's probably closest to ethics, sustainability, and responsibility topics anyway, um, because we do have uh, an implied ethics in legislation, for instance, if we're thinking about globalization or globalization, as I like to call it, automatically you're thinking about global and local issues and those issues are social, environmental and economic. Um, so that's a quite, quite an easy one to make sure that we do get that um, that idea of uh, how do social, environmental, and ethical things play a role here as well for my strategizing process. But then you see that's the macro environment. We do have the industry environment as well, and we do have the internal environment. So let's have a quick look at all of these. Um, so if you're looking at the internal environment, um, uh, you can think about or the, the combination between your industry environment and internal environment, that kind of uh, a boundary between them. So we might have inside out linkages, and this is uh, Porter and Kramer speaking in, in their strategic CSR paper um, in Harvard Business Review. So the inside out link linkages actually describe how the internal environment influences the external environment. So maybe the positive impacts that we have, but in most of the corporations, overall rather a negative impact, unfortunately. So we need to think about how our strategy actually impacts the environment, but also the other way around. Where are the strategic opportunities in social and environmental ethical topics that I can use outside in? Good, so for the external environment analysis, uh, very often, I know some people say it's boring, but I think it's a very powerful tool and very often that's what we're using. Uh, we can use Porter's five forces. We just have to have a, uh, shift in our perspective. So we're not interested anymore in that one strategy for commercial and economic topics uh, and economic competitiveness of our company, but actually we're having a strategy that aims at responsible competitiveness. And that also means we need to rethink what do new entrants into my industry, into my market mean? 
Maybe new entrants means new opportunities and not new competitors because I can cooperate with them in achieving my goals and their goals. Um, what does buyer's bargaining power mean? Maybe it's great to have a higher bargaining power of your stakeholders because they can tell you much, much more clearly and work with you in achieving social environmental goals. Um, so just some examples of how that we think it might actually work. And then if you look at the internal environment, well, um, you can actually go function for, by function in the business uh, um, structures. And you can think, okay, so in my marketing and sales, what could I do? What kind of course related marketing uh, campaign could I uh, implement in order to raise funny for a worthy uh, funny, um, money for a worthy cause? Uh, what kind of uh, social marketing campaign would maybe uh, serve my, uh, my social purpose? So marketing for behavior change, social marketing. Or if you're going over to procurement, oh, let's see uh, what our uh, supply chain is actually doing. Maybe now that everybody's talking about net zero, I'm not only doing the cheapest version of net zero, I'm making my office or my internal operations uh, carbon neutral or hopefully even carbon negative. So in a way regenerative. Uh, no, let's look at the wider supply chain. Maybe let's even look at the impact of all of my, all of my products and let's assume responsibility for that. So that's what we call the extended chain of uh, responsibility, just as an example, once again. Um, and then the point is really then um, what internal, so the internal analysis often is about what strategic uh, capabilities, strategic competences, uh, capacities do we have in order to actually achieve a competitive advantage? So what gives me that competitive advantage and how can I sustain it over time? Um, so there's a big difference, of course, between, uh, let's say, what you're doing is uh, actually something that's not really helping the environment, and it's not really um, in any way an advantage for you at all. So it doesn't help your environmental goals, for instance, and it's not a commercial advantage either. So then you do have a competitive disadvantage because you're spending time, energy, resources on something that doesn't help anybody. Or if you're actually on the exact opposite end of things, you might have a sustained competitive advantage. A sustained competitive advantage is one where you do something that's so unique and is at the same absolutely valuable and it's heterogeneously distributed. So that means you have it, others don't have it. Well, then you can actually have that sustained competitive advantage. And uh, one of the examples I love to use is a, uh, a, a small kind of sub island of the island of Koh Tao in, uh, uh, in Thailand. Um, which is so unique in its position, so unique in its environmental resources. So it's a diving location, unfortunately, which has de uh, degraded a lot, um, but so unique that you can't just build that. Nobody can imitate that. It's beautiful in the way it is. Nobody else can artificially make that. So that is a sustained competitive advantage. Although, and here comes the, comes the caveat, um, if you're actually doing what has been done there, uh, which is um, overusing the coral reefs for, uh, for diving and, and exploration, you might actually lose part of that unique strategic competitive advantage. So even if it's sustained, you still need to protect it. And often that might actually mean protecting your environmental resources, which are part of your competitive advantage. And uh, just as a question, maybe for the discussion later on when, when I'm coming into your course. Um, so do you think Tesla does have, have a sustained competitive advantage? And uh, if so, do they actually want to have one? Or if not, uh, do they care? Good. Uh, I don't think we have to talk about the SWOT analysis, but just one statement that is that the SWOT analysis actually, uh, I think is so, so often used because it very neatly combines both the uh, resource-based models of competitive advantage, so what's happening on the inside with what we have, and also the environmental models of competitive advantage. So how good is my industry structure, which is the traditional uh, uh, port uh, five forces uh, type of uh, type of argument that you need to be in a good industry um, to be good uh, and to be profitable. Good. So now we're actually moving over to the actual strategies. So your tactics, your plans for achieving a certain goal. And uh, typically we uh, look at those three different levels, corporate level strategies. So overall, if you've got several business units serving several, several markets, you have an overall strategy, business level strategies, one per market. So business here stands for market, one business in, in every market um, that you're serving. And then functional level strategies. So the HR strategy or um, the sourcing strategy. So the functions on your value chain. Just an example for each. So uh, think about the Clorox company, for instance. Clorox 
uh, you might might know it as a brand for cleaning products, um, but at the same time, it's a huge corporation of uh, uh, household goods. Uh, and if you look here, you see that, for instance, the uh, uh, um, the company Greenworks is one of Clorox brands. So Greenworks is a, a sustainable uh, a cleaning products uh, provider, completely different to their main brand Clorox, which is a very very aggressive chlorine bleach uh, product, which does the same thing basically. But then also there is uh, Bird's Bees. I, actually, I know Bird's Bees has moved to Brazil now. Uh, Bird's Bees, I think, is now part of Natura, of, of the, the big Brazilian uh, um, uh, Manaus-based uh, based company. Um, but at this point in time, that was a very interesting thing because they actually said, okay, although our overall corporation might not be the best, and particularly our main product is uh, not really good for the environment, we're actually learning. We're learning from Bird's Bees, uh, who have been uh, born environmentally friendly, most of it most of the time, and Greenworks is where we are, we are translating our learning. So the overall horizontal integration of those different business units, different markets, is what makes their sustainability corporate strategy, uh, corporate strategy at the corporate level, the strategy for sustainable development. Um, and then if you look at markets, well, you can think about once again, uh, um, the, um, the, the strategic market positioning. So once again, it's Porter, he's everywhere, isn't he? Um, so we don't really need to talk uh, in depth about that, but um, I think the main takeaway here is that in any kind of market positioning that you want to have, you can achieve it through ethics, responsibility, and sustainability topics as well. And a really interesting example that I like is actually um, the very local, uh, so narrow scope uh, company, Gomina, um, who are producing a low cost product. Very often people say, no, you can't do sustainability in low cost, blah, 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 blah. No, it's not true. You can do it anywhere. Um, and you have to do it anywhere. That's the other part of it uh, because we're in big trouble. But uh, so Gomina is a, a hair gel product. You see, I used a little bit too much of it. It's uh, anyway, um, but, but this product is uh, what they did actually at, at some point in time was in that local city of San Luis Potosí, which is a medium sized city for Mexican uh, considerations, uh, about a million people living there basically. Um, and they started using, instead of selling the gel in, in plastic uh, uh, um, uh, plastic bottles, they would actually start selling it in big jars that would be in the stores and people could actually fill and bring back their own plastic bottles so that they become reusable because that's the main impact. Um, so very, very interesting uh, that you can even do it in a context where most people think, nah, that, that doesn't really work. And then the last example about that is really, and now we're moving to the, to, uh, um, the, the business unit, uh, the, uh, sorry, not the business unit, the business function level. So uh, an interesting example is Dell, but also uh, uh, PepsiCo, where uh, diversity and inclusion is actually not only a social uh, concern or social care that they uh, that they have, but it is something that is core to their innovation strategy uh, in order to foster innovation uh, through a very diverse workforce. Good. Last point. Last section. Executing, and that one's going to be quick. Um, so here's all about how to bring all of those different pieces together and make them work together. Um, so we can think about that kind of uh, synergy map, uh, which uh, Mike, Michael Porter call, called it. So how do all of my different parts of the, the activities that I have come together in order to make the strategy work? And um, that is something that uh, can uh, very often be, uh, depends on two different things. Uh, typically it's about soft wiring. So how do you get into the social fabric of the organization, people in general? Uh, and the hard wiring, so the, the more fixed organization structure elements. And uh, you have already seen that some organizations like um, the, the, the Cola company uh, from the beginning, they actually don't have a lot of those hard wiring activities. So there's another internal part of strategy where you're part of your tactics of achieving the strategy is either through people or through structures or some kind of mixture of both most of the time. And uh, my, my personal favorite topic is actually business models. And uh, business models are often um, considered an, a strategy execution uh, instrument. Although if we take the practice, practicing part of strategy seriously, so that, that it's not just top down, but strategy is actually continuously made bottom up, it's continuously renewed, uh, then this idea of execution doesn't actually make a lot of sense. But the question once again is here, how is strategy actually being practiced and implemented continuously? 
And the business model typically has those four elements, value proposition, which I already mentioned. So this is your goal. What kind of value do you create continuously through your organization? Value creation, how do you actually do it? Value exchange, how do you move value around? And uh, it goes into both directions because your stakeholders exchange different things with you as well in both directions. And your value capture, how do you make sure that actually some of that value remains, it builds something? And not only value capture in the sense of how big is my margin, how do I get money in, but how do I make sure that the social, environmental, and economic value that I create actually is not just lost? This is the basic idea. So there's a very strong uh, regenerative idea behind that, which is great for the sustainability context. So an exercise that you can do for any organization is actually to see how do the different unique activities of that organization come together. And then you can then you can start thinking about how do those different activities together make those four parts happen. So how do they propose value? How do they actually create it? How do they actually uh, um, exchange value with their stakeholders? How do they capture it? And where do they capture it? Uh, so really interesting way of just uh, just trying to to understand how that um, that strategy lives in an organization, how they're doing it continuously. Good. We don't need to, uh, to repeat all of the, the principles, but the short story here is really, well, we do have something that we call responsible competitiveness, which is not just competitiveness for one stakeholder, your owners, but a competitiveness for all of the stakeholders together. So we're doing, uh, we, we, in the same way, we have to then scan the internal and external environment so that we actually know what matters internally, externally to all of those stakeholders. We have to think about how do we actually then draft strategies on the different levels, the corporate st st uh, strategies, if we are a corporation, business unit level strategies, and also functional level strategies. And then we have to think about how do we implement those strategies and how do we make sure that the continuous practicing of strategy actually results in the kind of strategy that I wanna have. So this is really the, um, the short, short story. I hope I didn't go too uh, far beyond time. And still, I would like to show you a couple of the materials that we have at the end of the new chapter. You might know that one already. It was in the first edition of the book as well. So uh, Mark Kramer, who wrote this uh, shared value uh, paper and which has like shared value itself has been something that, that's in everybody's mouth right now, something that everybody talks about and has been talking about for 10 years. So have a look at this interview, very interesting. But then also you can have, uh, have a look at uh, uh, Kansu's uh, professional profile, how she actually practices strategy in her job in Turkey. Um, and then you have a true story in there. So uh, somebody who we, we anonymized the person because there are some juicy details in there that they won't, don't want to have their name on necessarily. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a true story of somebody who actually has run through a very tricky strategizing process. And then uh, finally, we do have something that I think is uh, uh, actually at the very core of the chapter, how strategy does not go from planning to execution. There's not that linear, deliberate strategy going from here to over there where we want to be. No, as uh, Henry Minsberg already uh, 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 played with in the 1980s, 1980s, 1990s, that deliberate strategy barely ever happens. And that's once again why that practicing, that strategizing is so important. It's not being on the drawing board and then moving on uh, towards that neat and flawless execution. No, there are many unrealized strategies. And then there are also emergent strategies that come in somewhere midway. So very, very important to keep that in mind and something that's really at the core of what we've done it together. Um, you've got worksheets in there, but then also what I really like are those, um, uh, those mind maps where we uh, have kind of more intuitive and messy way of uh, building our own picture of, of what strategizing is. So many of the things we talked about, you will see there, others you probably haven't, haven't possibly talked about yet and you will, will see then get curious. So hopefully this is just the, the beginning of a discussion and maybe the beginning of a learning journey where you take some of those things and build them together in your own way. Well, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me once again. And I'm really, really looking forward to being with you and uh, having a good discussion uh, very soon.